This podcast is brought to you by India Knowledge at Wharton. Please visit knowledge.wharton.upenn.edu slash India for more information. Inclusive growth, infrastructure development, and collaboration in science and technology were the major themes discussed at the recent Global Partnership Summit organized in Washington, D.C. by the U.S.-India Business Council. Business and political leaders from both countries participated in the event, which also marked the USIBC's 33rd anniversary. Indian Knowledge at Wharton spoke with business leaders at the event about the challenges they face doing business in a rapidly globalizing economy. Our guest today is Sunil Bharti Mittal, Chairman and Managing Director of the Bharti Group. Mr. Mittal, thank you so much for joining us today. It's my pleasure. You started in business in 1976 at age 18 with $1,500 that you borrowed from your father. I believe your first business was making bicycle crankshafts. Could you tell us about your earliest entrepreneurial experiences and what you learned from them? Well, as you know, I, I grew up or I was raised in Ludhiana, a very industrious town where almost everybody is an entrepreneur of some sort or some kind. And it is the bedrock of small-scale industry. And the principal industry being cycles or cycle parts, hosiery or yarn to make uh, netware and light engineering uh, items. And uh, coming out of college with that small amount of capital, one could only do what was allowed in the ecosystem there. And I decided to manufacture bicycle parts, in particular crankshafts. It was a hot forging unit that I put up. And that's where I cut my teeth into business. You moved to Bombay in 1980. At that time, your business plans were a little more ambitious. Could you tell us a little bit more about your business ventures at that time? Well, I realized that uh, one could probably make some modest success out of what I started to do in bicycle parts, but there was a limitation. At the end of the day, the manufacturers of bicycles decided how much, at what price you could supply to them. And just making shafts wouldn't have made you a player of any size or scale. So I was very clear that I had to get out of Ludhiana into a much uh, bigger play in Delhi or Mumbai, uh, Bombay at that time. And I spent about two, three years in Bombay importing a variety of products, mm, steel, brass, zinc, uh, zip fasteners, plastics, and eventually brought India's first portable generator. And that was the first turning point. Was that the venture with Suzuki? It was with Suzuki. And that's how I got in touch with the Japanese, spent uh, two to three years with them, learning their techniques, practices, internationalized my concepts, learned the art of diplomacy in international trade. So I would say that was the period uh, which uh, gave me opportunities to, on one hand, earn some uh, significantly higher amounts of money than I could have done in cycle trade. And more importantly, gave me that independence and experience of marketing, brands, international trade. And that, that helped me in good stead later on. What were the main lessons you learned at that point of your career? I think two or three things. I realized very early on that you need to tie up with some large entities, much, much larger than yourself. And if you see from there on, the string of partnerships are all with very large companies, multi-billion dollar corporations. So Suzuki, AT&T, Siemens, Lucky Gold Star at that time now, uh, LG, and uh, Suzuki Motor Company was there, of course. British Telecom, Telecom Italia. So th that is what I followed tie up with large companies. And it's easy to say, but large companies intuitively don't, uh, you know, ally with small companies or entrepreneurs. So one had to persuade these large companies, show them the Indian market, your high governance structure, despite being a small company, and give them the comfort to join hands with you to exploit and uh, come into the Indian market together. How did you enter the phone business? Well, that, uh, I would say, was a happy stance. Uh, in fact, you can call it an accident because the government banned the import of generators. And uh, one fine day, there was no business. All the business that I developed was gone. And my beat was Japan, Korea, Taiwan. I went back into those areas looking for a new product. And one of the uh, theories that I built around my entrepreneurship was do things that have not been done before. Because if you're competing with the big boys in areas where they are strong, there was no chance for us to succeed. And in my quest to now look for the next big breakthrough product, which also didn't need too much capital, was uh, met in Taiwan in a, in a trade fair when I saw push button telephones. And I brought India's first telephone set uh, replacing the rotary phones. And that became a huge success. And my romance with telecom 
started thereafter. So it went on to cordless phones, answering machines, fax machines, and then India's first mobile phone. India in those days was such a highly regulated market and an especially challenging environment for somebody who wanted to be innovative. How did you navigate your way around those currents? Tough, but as an entrepreneur, you get trained on everything. You, you understand import policy, you know, customs book, you know, excise laws. Uh, you practically learn to do everything yourself. And you hit roadblocks, you have difficulties, but I had opened my own LCs, cleared my own consignments, taken the material on trucks myself to the market. So uh, an entrepreneur gets a huge amount of experience. And then you also know how to deal and uh, move uh, into their system. And the good news is that my excellency in the entrepreneurial area truly started happening alongside the breaking down of these barriers. Uh, more the barriers dropped, the more uh, we surged. So 92 in that sense was the turning point when uh, uh, the Narsimha Rao government along with the now Prime Minister Manmohan Singh, then Finance Minister, decided to open up. About 10, 20 of us young entrepreneurs really moved in. And uh, each one of us have created a, a fantastic business out of that. So in concrete terms, how did the business environment change so that it allowed this entrepreneurial surge to happen? Telephone manufacturing, completely regulated what you could import, what you could not import, how much you could manufacture. I got my first industrial license to make cordless telephones. It had a limit of two crores of sales. I mean, it's ridiculous when you go back half a million dollars today. You could not man manufacture more than two crores of sales. Now, if you see that number, what does it mean? Subscale operations, small, tiny factory, and uh, you don't manufacture telecom products like that. No, it's not a small-scale uh, factory that you can put up. And suddenly, one day, the government said, no license is required. From controlling what you could do, it has gone one day. You know? And that, to my mind, was uh, the first time when the entrepreneurial energies were released into more constructive arena of marketing, branding, you know, doing the right things. In just about 10 years, you have built Bharti into India's largest mobile operator. How did that come about? And what are some of the main lessons you learned from your experience that could be helpful to other entrepreneurs? Well, I think very clearly we could have never claimed that we had more capital or better technologies because everybody was buying the same technology. It's GSM. It's a set standard. Uh, we couldn't claim that we had a massive brand or distribution strength in the market. The only thing that we needed on our side was speed, and we used that to great effect. We were in the market ahead of uh, competition. We brought new products in the market ahead of competition. We rolled out our networks. We begged, borrowed, stole, put things out. And while they were never near perfect, um, they were there first. And that gave us, to my mind, a lot of advantage. So our theory was if you're caught between speed and perfection, always choose speed and perfection will follow because we never waited for a perfect positioning because in business you don't have the time, especially if you're small, you can't do it. And the large companies took their own time. They were months behind us and that made us uh, pick up a market niche for ourselves, which in turn made us big. How did you position yourself against your competitors? Was your strategy based entirely on speed or did you also have other tactics? No, I think one thing was we were very, very passionate about our business. This was the only business we were doing. And other competitors had other businesses, and this was one of the new businesses they were starting. And uh, speed, uh, new products into the market, close to the customer, knowing what the customer wants. I think we lived that whole uh, space ourselves day in, uh, day out. And that made all the difference. How do you see Bharti's future in the mobile industry? I know you tried recently to merge with MTN in South Africa, but that merger didn't work out. What were your strategic goals for that merger and what else might you be considering for the future? Well, we believe that while India is not done, in as far as rolling out networks, the process is done. Uh, we'll keep on adding two and a half, three million customers a month until we get to a point where India has seven, eight hundred million customers. Management teams are in place, brand is very strong, distribution is in place, company has no debt. So India is done. Now, what does the senior management team do? You have to create new opportunities of growth. And they lie in other emerging markets, they're for Africa, Middle East. And we have today a business model which is uh, the f uh, best business model in the world. Lowest costs with the highest quality. And I think that model is ready to go out. So we would like to, whenever we get an opportunity like MTN, to seriously attempt for putting some assets together. Would you look for partners in other parts of the world? 
Well, we, we keep on uh, getting shown opportunities around the globe and we remain open. Let's turn now to the retail industry where you have a partnership with Walmart. Help me understand how you evaluated the retail opportunity and what your thought process was in making the decisions you did. Well, we wanted to do something more in India. As we grow telecom outside India, I think there are other opportunities in India. And one of them we felt was in the area of retail. And India's retail needs to get organized and it will one day. It may take its own time and everything in India does take time. But we will organize the retail to a point where over $100 billion will come through organized retail stores. And we had the opportunities to tie up with Carrefour, Tesco's, and um, uh, Walmart. And in fact, we were almost on the signing stage with Tesco when the Walmart meeting started to happen. And we liked Lee Scott's model. We liked the same low-cost uh, delivery mechanism, values of Sam Walton. So I would say that we are very, very uh, pleased to have entered this area. It has its own uh, issues. Like telecom, this has the resistances built in. There are barriers. There are issues. And we enjoy probably dealing with these issues. Speed was the hallmark of your experience in the mobile industry, but of course the retail market is very, very different. How do you deal with those challenges? It's frustrating. I think I must confess that it's going much slower than what we originally thought. Speed is still what we like, but uh, this is in, now a large company. We have tie up with a large company. They believe that you need to tie up a lot of loose ends before you launch yourself. And the first three stores that have opened up in assistance with Walmart demonstrate that planning does uh, make a difference. So we are spending a lot of time planning. It's not wasted uh, time. The supply chain is being built. First distribution center has come up. The three stores are having infill rates of 95% and are having sales uh, per square foot of 30-40% higher than the other top two or three other operators in the country. So start is good. It is surely slow. But I think you'll start seeing some action fairly soon. Are any political changes needed to make that happen? Well, FDI must be allowed. We would rather have Walmart right in there with equity rather than providing franchise support from outside. Yes, we would like uh, FDI to open up. You have been quoted as saying that India needs a football revolution. So how exactly would that come about? Well, I mean, it's a, it's a shame and, uh, you know, in some sense saddens my heart that a country like India does not have any representation in the world soccer. And it's a sport which is watched by largest amount of people in the world. We're talking about hundreds of millions of people, uh, topping over a billion people who watch uh, soccer. Did you play soccer growing up? No, we played everything as, as kids uh, in, the, in the middle class families do. But I won't say football was my main uh, sport, but it is of one of my sons. Both my sons play, my nephews play, and uh, my son plays fairly competitive football. I enjoy watching it with them. And uh, it's also, to my mind, a sport which can create a revolution of sorts in a country like India very soon. One ball, one open field, few kids, and it starts off. You know, there are no kit, expensive kits or equipment required to support this uh, game. You know, And uh, I also believe that India had a uh, football uh, base earlier on. In 1950, they were in the World Cup. They could not play it because they didn't have shoes. And they refused to wear shoes, and they couldn't play. And that was the last time India ever reached that point. And I see no uh, harm in giving it one serious shot of getting an Indian team into 2018. I personally believe we'll get there. Ten years is a good time for us to plan. Cricket has received quite a shot in the arm with the formation of the Indian Professional League. Is that in the cards for football? Yeah, India is a cricketing uh, nation. It's a cricket mad nation and I think we need an alternate sport. We need something else outside cricket. And will football have its own uh, Premier Leagues? It will certainly have. In fact, the IPL is a copy of English Premier League. And that's the fundamental basis of football. And yes, we will see something on those lines. It'll take a long time for people to switch from cricket to football. But uh, younger people are watching a lot of international soccer. Uh, there is going to be the European Cup in Austria in a few days from now. And you can see already, already some fever building up in India. Timing is right. In all the years that you've been an entrepreneur, what is the single biggest leadership challenge that you have faced? How did you deal with it and what did you learn from it? Well, it's hard to, you know, put down it to a single event in life that what will be the hardest decision. But I would say bidding for a mobile license against all odds. In 1992, when I was a rank outsider, there was, uh, I think the total sales was about $5 million in all. And going and bidding for a mobile license was tough. But we persevered, we went into it. 
against the mites of the biggest of the biggest in the country and the world. And we ended up getting a license. And more importantly, not only a license, we rolled out India's first network and have now become the largest. So that starting point of having the, in a sense, defiance of the logic of, uh, you know, this is only for the big boys, this needs deep pockets, don't even look at this. That defiance of the conventional wisdom, to my mind, was very important. And in your mind, uh, being determined to challenge that thought that you can't do it as a young entrepreneur. Mr. Mittal, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. For more information, please visit knowledge.wharton.upen.edu slash India.